The title, 诗是实诗史 The content, 实事实事实事事实事实实事事实实事事事实实实事实实事事事实事实事事实事实实事事实事实事实事事实事实事实事实事实事。是是是是是是是是实实是是是是。Of course, of course. What most people don't know is how close the ancient Chinese written language came to extinction. The chaos of the century of humiliation was the cause of contemplation for the generation of foreign-taught intellectuals who would be tasked with the gargantuan mission of saving their civilization from collapse. To save the ancient culture, though, brought up the painful decision to potentially jettison parts or even all of the cherished traditions, like a surgeon amputating a gangrenous limb. This is a story that explains a simple question: Why was Beijing called Peking for so many years? What, on the surface, seems like a rudimentary difference in semantics between different cultures, is in fact the story of a nation's struggle for the survival of its identity. As is the case with history, time over. The failure to resist one's conquerors led to the losing of the right to use one's own mother tongue. In the case of China, during the century of humiliation, however, physical conquest was only one aspect of the decline of Chinese civilization. Subjugation by its conquerors would bring to surface the painfully obvious redundancies of Chinese culture to the surface for all to see. And this redundancy, the subject of the video, is the Chinese language itself. As a non-Chinese who studied Mandarin for a decade and attended a Chinese university. I sometimes feel like I've wasted my life. Every single day when I read the newspaper, I see a character I have never encountered before in my 10 years of study, only to never see that character ever again. With 144,000 officially recognized characters, it's almost impossible to believe there was actually a time where Chinese was even harder. So much harder, in fact, so impossible for the average Chinese person to learn that they almost got rid of it entirely. The reason why Beijing was called Peking for almost 100 years. Is because before the 1950s, there was virtually no officially recognized link between the extremely unique Chinese language and the languages of the rest of the world. Since the time of the Portuguese contact with the Ming Dynasty all the way to the late Qing, bridging communication with the outside world was not only considered unnecessary; people caught teaching Chinese to foreigners would be executed. Whilst China had no interest in the outside world, the outside world was interested in China. From the early Jesuit missionaries to the Dutch traders, then the imperial powers of the 18th and 19th century, the European nations, since time of first contact, have painstakingly tried to crack the code of the Chinese language for hundreds of years. For centuries, they tried to bridge the communication gap with China, whether it was for missionary work, trade, or diplomacy. But the task was incredibly difficult. The end product of centuries of collective effort by some of the brightest and bravest people of the time produced an imperfectly cobbled together system that allowed rudimentary communication to exist between foreigners and Chinese. This system was called Wade Giles, named after its two pioneers. The system took the spoken language, then crunched them down into the best approximation of what Chinese sounded like. There were many flaws with this system. Case in point, the naming of Beijing as Peking. It wasn't only Beijing though. Guangdong was written as Guangtong, Hebei was written as Hebei, Qinghai became Xinghai, etc., etc. Of course, these names weren't intended to be read aloud in an anglicized way, but considering users of such a system were not proficient Chinese speakers, the names were taken at face value and simply became accepted as a standard by those who used them. You might be thinking the simple solution would be to just write the Chinese how it sounds. The problem was there wasn't really a Chinese back then. This is going to sound controversial and fly in the face of my five thousand years history. But the Chinese we know today did not really exist until fairly recently in history, and what did exist was in an extremely limited format. Mandarin in Chinese, Pu Tonghua, means standard language. But before, no such standard language existed. A hundred years ago, there were a multitude of different dialects and languages, with no particular standard being adhered to. This is partially reflected still to this day, where 20% of the population are still unable to speak Mandarin. The standard Mandarin that is spoken today is one of the many minority Chinese dialects that have existed throughout millennia. 
This particular variant, however, is the native dialect of Beijing, which has mostly served as the capital since the Mongol occupation, giving it precedent over the other language groups. The language of the capital would proliferate in China throughout the centuries, only to calcify into unintelligible variants that could be considered languages in their own right. The Mandarin that would become the standard we know today was a language exclusively used by the ruling elite of the Qing dynasty. This variation of Beijing Mandarin would probably have been unintelligible to the average person on the streets, as it was the language for officials, hence the name given to it, Guanghua, official language. This official language that would be the predominant language of today was almost exclusively used by the minority ruling elite of Confucian scholars, the dynastic elite, and the courtesans. It was a court dialect. This is why it was not so obvious to simply write Chinese how it sounds. The strange spelling and botched pronunciation of the wade guile system owes to the fact that it was adopted for the southern varieties of Mandarin, which would have been much more widely spoken at the time. A notable difference being that J sounded more like K, hence the king in Peking. The vast internal difference in pronunciation and language was a great cause of disunity and inefficiency. John Quincy Adams, observing the first opium war, noted, quote, that the fight was not over chest of opium and unfair trade, but words and their meanings. If China couldn't communicate with the rest of the world, it was because China was also struggling to communicate within its borders." End quote. Adams is referring to the failure of communication between the Qing and the British that led to the breakdown of diplomacy. Certain concepts were not translatable at the time, such as rights and sovereignty, and within the country itself, people of the North could not communicate with people of the South. The problem of language was not exclusive to speech, but also written text. As I mentioned, there were 144,000 officially recognized Chinese characters. The world was increasingly connected by telegraphy, print media, and standardized forms of communication, made to suit a 26-letter phonetic alphabet. The inability to engage diplomatically with foreign nations, to join the global trade network, and to receive the latest technological and scientific updates would be like an ox cart trying to race a train. Failure to hand-fist all those characters into an intelligible format for outsiders to read would ultimately lead to the death of their civilization. This was a great horror to the intellectuals of the 19th century, who were split down the middle between reforming the language and ending it entirely. Of the latter group, a large heap of the blame for the degeneration of civilization was placed on the inefficiencies of the language, to such an extent that it was seen as some kind of curse. Jing Su in the book Kingdom of Characters writes, quote, Even learning the Chinese script, some Chinese educators soon worried it would wreak havoc on the body. Fanned by the recent introduction of Western anatomy, especially the brain and the nervous system, people began to fear that long-term exposure to rote learning made one lose intelligence. The fear of mental exhaustion soon created a mass market for health remedies like Dr. Yale's A. Law Brain Tonic and Dr. Williams' Pink Pill for Pale People for anyone from students to businessmen. Peddled by a marketing genius, Huang Chujiao of Shanghai, A. Luo Brain Tonic, which came with the English name of Yale, because Huang thought a foreign name made it more fancy, was a sensational bestseller across the country, and was still available for purchase in certain back alley pharmacies until recent times. End quote. Along with the introduction of foreign concepts like Western anatomy, also came the penetration of political ideas, many of them radical in nature. The burden of saving society lay on the freshly foreign-educated Chinese students returning home, and many of them returned with ideas such as Marxism, Anarchism, and Esperantism. For the Marxists, the characters are a symbol of China's class struggle, where only the privileged can afford to spend upwards of a decade immersed in the Confucian classics in order to learn to read and write. The anarchists were similar in sentiment, in that they believed true reform could only take place if the traditional culture was overthrown entirely. A smaller and less well-known group, the Esperantists, espoused the use of a new made-up international language called Esperanto, which they believed would one day become the world language, owing to it being specifically designed for the purpose of being learnable for any person of any background. These groups would play a critical role in the reformation of language in the 20th century. Ultimately, they were correct. The length it takes to become proficient in written Chinese makes it so any peasant with an average lifespan of 27 would not want to waste half their precious life learning the language. As such, the privilege falls on the elite class who would spend the rest of their life pursuing this niche skill, and under their helm, the language would continue to develop, making literacy increasingly complex for the average person.
There was a conservative pushback against this elimination of Chinese characters though. Of the foreign educated intellectuals, there were those that returned with notions of nationalism, those that had ingratiated themselves with the secret societies, but also those of more traditional Confucian upbringings who wanted change, but also wanted to preserve China's cultural legacy. The rivalry between these groups is a story that would shape the destiny of China and continues to play out to this day. The journey to turning Peking back into Beijing was a grueling journey built on the backs of the collective efforts of dedicated patriots who wanted to see the restoration of their country's glory. One of these patriots was named Wang Zhao. Wang Zhao is almost forgotten and the retelling of his harrowing account to save the Chinese language gets a footnote in history at best. So I'm going to retell his story to give him the honor he deserves. Wang Zhao is the grandson of a famous horse archer general who fought against the British during the Opium War and won the Chinese equivalent of the Iron Cross. That's right, a horse archer fighting against cannons and muskets. That actually happened. He was of a line of fiercely dedicated Confucian ministers, but unlike his grandfather, Wang would take up the pen instead of the sword, and his life's mission was to reform the Chinese language by making the very first Chinese alphabet. Wang Zhao served as the chief minister of rights in the Qing court, and he along with others convinced the young, open-minded Guangxu emperor to embark on a major campaign of modernization and self-strengthening. This was a period known as the Hundred Days Reform. The reform was thwarted by the powerful conservative faction led by the emperor's aunt, Emperor Dowager Sishi, owing to the fact that such reforms would make the bloated bureaucracy redundant and Sishi's grip over her niece's power would be diminished. As such, a sizable crop of China's reformist-minded intelligentsia were executed or imprisoned, sealing the fate of the crumbling empire. Not Wang Zhao though. Seeing his comrades tortured to death for trying to save the country, he escaped to Japan where he doubled his efforts to save the Chinese language. After years of mingling with the Chinese intellectuals in Japan and forming his new Mandarin alphabet, Wang would embark on the dangerous mission of returning back to China as a wanted criminal. Disguised as a Buddhist monk, carrying a staff in one hand and his life's work on a piece of rice paper in his pocket, he lived life disguised as an unwashed monk, making his way barefoot from Nanjing to Beijing to bring his work to the right people. Only traveling by night and on less traveled roads, this educated imperial scholar experienced firsthand the effects of ignorance on the peasants. The state of literacy at that time was 30% amongst men and 2% for women. In his journal, he would scoff at the superstitious commoners who blamed the poor harvest on the curse of the German railroads in Qingdao. Wang traveled through the areas that had come under the influence of the boxers, a superstitious cult of uneducated, hyper-nationalist peasants who didn't understand why China was in the state it was in, but attributed any and all decay to the changes the foreigners brought. The solution for them didn't involve solving complex problems with practical solutions, but relying on superstitious rituals to beat the rifle-wielding foreign occupiers with their boxing skills and spells. This was the kind of ignorance that Wang felt plagued the country, and the focal point of this backwards attitude towards problem solving was the country's state of illiteracy. Wang arrived Tianjin on the cusp of the invasion of the Eight Nation Alliance to quash the Boxer Uprising. He hid there for a year at a friend's house, still trying to crack the code of alphabetizing the Chinese language. In a stroke of luck and brilliance, his friend bought him an old codec commissioned by Emperor Kangxi in 1726. It had taken 11 years to complete by 13 different Confucian scholars, and the purpose was to teach the Manchu elite how to speak Mandarin. What was so groundbreaking about this work is that prior to this, Chinese pictographic characters had never been converted into the alphabet of another language, but with this book, the method for converting the characters into the Manchu alphabet was made possible. Wang would take this mechanism and combine it with Japanese kana. Japanese kana, also known as katagana, was a kind of alphabet formed from Chinese characters. With the mechanisms of these two different language systems, he combined them together to make the first fully functioning Mandarin alphabet. As it was still a fugitive in hiding, he left it up to his friends in court to get the word out about this new linguistic piece of technology, and it was a big success at the time. By 1906, Wang's alphabet was being taught to school children nationwide. Even though he was still a fugitive, he risked opening a school in a back alley, only appearing behind a wooden screen during lessons while an ex-student taught the class. It would seem as if his life's work was now complete. There was one issue that bothered him more than even being forced into exile and living the life of a fugitive for over a decade, and that was other people taking credit for his work. As the writing system was published anonymously, hacks from all around the country would claim to be the inventor and would receive press acclaim. But worse was that these frauds opened schools only to teach incorrect, bastardized versions of his original magnum opus. Despite everything he had been through, this was the straw that broke the camel's back. He decided to turn himself in. He appeared before a Beijing police station constable to confess his identity and all that had transpired. 
The credit for inventing the language came back to him. The fake schools closed, but now he was locked away in the labyrinth of the imperial penal system, where very few people survive even the shortest sentences. What made this experience particularly harrowing for him was that one of his 100 Days Reform co-conspirators had recently been captured and beaten to death in the exact same cell he was placed in, with the blood of the deceased left painted on the walls six feet high. Very few people came out alive, and once entering the prison system, you simply disappear. Wong's despair would be interrupted by thoughts of his beloved creation and his still intact vision of saving the country. As the months ticked by and his existence became more akin to a ghost who refused to cross to the other side, he got a tap on his cell door and suddenly, he was a free man again. Fortunately for him, the Prime Minister had been implicated in the embezzlement of funds and the Empress Dowager's way of making amends was to pardon all the 100 day reformist conspirators, including Wang. With his soul now returned to his body, Wang would continue his mission. Now the focus is on unifying the country under one language. As a staunch Confucian scholar, promoting anything but the official language is analogous to blasphemy, and without proper guidance, China's fate was likely balkanization and fragmentation under linguistic lines. Wang would get his shot in 1912, just after the overthrowing of the Qing. He was invited to join a conference called the Commission on the Unification of Pronunciation, which aimed to finally set in stone which language was going to be spoke. Rather than just being a gathering of intellectuals to calmly discuss China's linguistic future, it was an arena for diehard patriot intellectuals, just like Wang, to battle it out with each other to ensure the survival of their own mother tongue. There could only be one winner in this death match. One language would survive, all the others will die in good time. A conference that's impact is still felt to this day. The delegates, or should I call them contestants, came from all around China to promote the use of their own language in favor of everyone else's. There was the official language faction, aka Mandarin, led by Wang. Then there was the Sichuanese faction. Then there was New Xiang, Old Xiang, Wu, aka Shanghainese, Hakka, Min, Gan, and the list goes on. But standout favorites of the conference was in fact the Cantonese. Having had more delegates than everyone, their voting power was enough to make Cantonese the lingua franca for generations to come. It wasn't cut and dry though, factions would compete with each other to win more votes by teaming up against a common rival and as such, the conference became a free-for-all that would last for weeks on end. With no official end date for the conference, it dragged on and on, starting early in the morning and going past midnight with little breaks. Delegates would spend all day at the conference arguing and scheming against their competitors. If someone was to leave the conference, that person risked losing their voting power, and so a war of attrition was to decide China's linguistic fate. In the book, Kingdom of Characters, Jing Su outlines the atrocious conditions of the conference. With no one willing to voluntarily leave the conference and risk being taken advantage of by their peers, people stayed until they were too sick to continue. Tuberculosis was common in those times, and a mix of fatigue, stress, and close proximity with others led to the conference hall being a petri dish of disease. Many of the diehard delegates would be forced to retire owing to being too sick to continue. Competition was fierce, even as the number of delegates thinned out. Wang, although spared from tuberculosis, was stricken with a severe case of hemorrhoids, owing to sitting down for weeks on end. For those who don't understand, Chinese furniture is about as comfortable as sitting on the pavement. Wang would write that his blood-soaked pants would seep blood down his legs that trickled out onto the floor of the hall. At this stage, it looked like the Cantonese were poised to win. But Wang was indignant. There's no way he would allow it. He organized his allies and some of the conference organizers to change how the votes were counted in order to balance the scales with the Cantonese. The conclusion to the conference would end in a bang, quote, Kingdom of Characters. His brute maneuvering came to a symbolic and literal climax when he rolled up his sleeves and physically chased the southern delegate out of the room. What set him off, ironically enough, was a dialectical inflection. The delegate had said the word rickshaw to a neighbor in his thick southern Wu dialect. To Wang's Mandarin ear, just a few seats over, it sounded awfully like he was calling Wang a son of a bitch. It was precisely to resolve this kind of verbal misunderstanding that had brought them together in the first place. Wang jumped out of his seat, tried to grab the delegate by his collar, and ran the poor man out of the hall. That episode was subsequently remembered as the most raucous exchange witnessed in the solemnly decorated halls of the ministry. The echoes of the escapee's scuttling footsteps drowned out by Wang's obscenities bouncing down the long corridors. The battered delegate was too intimidated to return, and Mandarin ultimately emerged as the truly viable 
sound pattern for the national phonetic alphabet. To this day, when asked, a southerner in Hong Kong or Guangdong will say, were it not for this fateful crossfire, Cantonese would have been chosen over Mandarin. The world would now be striving to master the varied intonations of southern China instead of crisp Beijing speak." End quote. And so it came to be that the language of China would thus be Mandarin. After a lifetime of battles, Wang retired and fade into obscurity, despite being responsible for changing the destiny of so many. The Mandarin alphabet he produced would be revised by others and will get the name Zhu Yin. This is the second most used character input method used in Chinese and is mostly used in Taiwan now. Our journey is yet to end though, and there would be one more major change that would take place before Peking would become Beijing once again. This change wouldn't come from a scholar, it wouldn't even come from someone who could speak Mandarin. This person would embark on one of the most ambitious language reforms in history, and that man was Mao Zedong. For all his shortcomings, Mao was passionate about writing. His famed calligraphy proudly sits on the masthead of the country's official newspaper, The People's Daily, and his collection of calligraphy was auctioned off at a price of half a million dollars. Like the many hopeful reformists of the early 20th century, Mao came to the conclusion during his stint as an assistant at the Beijing University Library that the survival of the civilization hinged on language reform. Unlike the more conservative voices like Wang Zhao, who wished to keep the Chinese characters as intact as possible, Mao came under the influence of the radical student movement who wished to jettison Chinese characters altogether. In his favorite magazine, New Youth, Mao would be exposed to the Marxist and anarchist views on what ought to be done with China's ancient language. Many of the intellectuals promoting language reform were foreign educated radicals who wished to get rid of Chinese characters entirely, seeing it as the cause for China's backwardsness. It was the language reserved for the elites of a feudalistic society, they would say. The language system that would be set to rival Wang Zhao's Mandarin alphabet would come to be known as Pinyin, the most used input method for Chinese characters to date. The reason why the Mandarin alphabet wasn't considered good enough for the more radical-minded reformists is that the Mandarin alphabet gives no hint about how the symbols should be pronounced. It can be taught to you, but such a system was not intuitive. The same thing applies to tones, which do not come intuitively to a learner. To emphasize this point, a poem was made to show how a lack of indication of tones would bamboozle any student. For Mao, he came to the belief that Chinese should integrate the English alphabet to make it more accessible to foreigners and Chinese alike, and instead of getting rid of Chinese characters in its entirety, characters would be made to be less complex, aka simplifying them. Mao doesn't get all the credit for simplifying the characters though. Simplifying characters had existed since the dawn of Chinese writing to allow people to informally write faster. Some of these characters arose from calligraphy, others were created by Taoists who used simplified characters to summon spirits. Many simplified characters came from the time of the Taiping rebels of the 19th century who used them in their writing records in self-issued currency. Attempts to simplify the Chinese characters were already underway during the Republican period, but the conservative senior members of the party couldn't bear to see a single stroke change on any character. One of them reportedly got down on his knees to beg Chiang Kai-shek to spare the life of the Chinese script. The war between the communists and the nationalists started to occupy the domain of the cultural as both sides' version of language reform would reflect their politics. The nationalists would uphold Wang Zhao's Mandarin alphabet, which reformed the language but kept it distinctly Chinese, while the communists upheld the anti-traditionalist view that such a reform should shed away the old way and use the English alphabet instead. Both used their reasoning to try win over the vast waves of illiterate peasants to pick a side. Do you want the old China or do you want the new China? The final product of Pinyin came as a result of rigorous testing for over a decade. The original drafts of Pinyin included Russian Cyrillic characters, Arabic numerals, and even shapes. These proposals were sent out to tens of thousands of public citizens for critique in a rare display of Communist China's intellectual openness. During the period in the 50s, known as the Hundred Flowers Campaign, many government policies were amended by proactively engaging the public in discourse, perhaps reflecting their idealistic nature of their more reformist-minded youth from long before they had come to power. And it was through this process of vetting that Pinyin would take its final shape. Mao, however, had a change of heart in 1957. As he watched the denunciation of Stalin in the Soviet Union and the Hungarian Revolt in 1956, the hundreds of thousands of critical letters they had solicited from the public now more closely represented a danger to his rule. The Hundred Flowers campaign would promptly end and be replaced with the anti riders campaigns, which specifically persecuted anyone who had provided critical feedback to the government. 
As opinions started to take hold, there were of course naturally people that didn't agree with some aspects of the system, just like how there were people who didn't agree with the Mandarin alphabet. Unlike the Mandarin alphabet though, the anti-writers campaigns saw to it that anyone critical of Pinyin would be thrown in prison. Those same people, upon release, would again be persecuted and often driven to suicide during the Cultural Revolution. With the extermination of critical opposition to the system and being enforced by executive fiat, adoption was 100%, and showing its place in history as an unchangeable monolith. The conclusion of the Civil War would only amplify this ongoing debate between the use of the Mandarin alphabet and pinyin on geographical lines, with Taiwan considering itself the old guard of Chinese culture, leaving characters unmolested and using the Mandarin alphabet, while the mainland would simplify their characters and use pinyin. Taiwan would also continue on with the Wade Giles form of writing Chinese names in English. As you can see on a map, the English writing for the names of things in Taiwan look distinctly archaic. Here you can see Kaohsiung, Xiaoyi City, Taichung, Hsinchu City. The same goes with people's names. The president's name, for instance, is Tsai Ing-wen. The politicization of the language would sharpen the difference between the writers of simplified script and traditional script throughout the world. Proponents of traditional characters would often hurl jabs at the simplified characters, noting some of the peculiar changes such as the removal of the heart radical from love in place of friend. What is love with no heart, they would say. Despite all the disagreements they have, the arguments they make against each other are purely arbitrary. Often simplification is chalked up to being a communist conspiracy to dumb down the public. But that's not true. The reality is, it's just an ongoing family feud that few people can comprehend. Alas my friends, we finally arrive at the end, with Beijing Mandarin officially adopted as the language of the nation, and Pinyin being used to write the names of Chinese things, at last Peking once again became Beijing. Thanks a lot for watching guys. If you want to support this channel sponsor, pick up a bottle of Dr. Alor's Brain Tonic using the link in the description below. Get 15% off and increase the size of your brain by 15%. Sign up with a real sponsor of this video, ExpressVPN. Check out my link in the description below to sign up with ExpressVPN. It's the best VPN that you can use in China, and with it, you can protect your online privacy. Thanks a lot for watching, guys. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe and give a like. Now, I'll see you in the next video. Peace.